you are going to be asking you a lot of questions and we recorded this session and we're going to be uh, shipping it out on different channels cutting this the small small pieces and shipping it out on different channels on social media all mm -hmm. right we we going to be uh, we're just waiting for patrick uh, hopefully patrick will also join in uh, all right so uh, we are three minutes uh, over our schedule so let me start uh, hopefully Patrick will join in thank you so much gentlemen thank you very much for coming over this morning your time is really appreciated um, we're gonna have some good fun here we're gonna be uh, ask I'm gonna be asking some some questions some might be daunting some you might might, might, might want to pass some might put you on the spot but you know what the more frank we are the more honest we are the more real we are the more informed we are the more the less prepared we are the better it is uh, we're going to be that will make the discussion a lot more authentic than pre-prepared questions pre-prepared answers so let me introduce myself and my company folks uh, my name is amit kaushal guys um, and um, i i am a co-founder of a company called inalito uh, inalito uh, is an it has an indian and the us origin company and uh, we are an AI ML based uh, software product company and we work for e-commerce companies, people who are basically selling, sh selling things online, whether it's you, Dave, uh, or Flip, uh, Philip, uh, anybody who's selling things online using Shopify, Magento would be our uh, client. We have about 25 clients in the US, 25 e-commerce companies in the US and about 10, 15 companies in India. We are helping them in um, uh, email marketing, in uh, predictive analysis, personalization, smart segmentation of customer products. We help them uh, save their digital marketing spend. We help them target target the right product to right customers. And we do help them a lot of analytics. We also help e-commerce companies in predicting their business health score so that they know where is their business heading to. Uh, apart from these, we also do a lot of fancy stuff uh, for e-commerce companies like yourself. Uh, that was me and my company i'm gonna uh, introduce dave first because dave was the guy who joined uh, first uh, on on uh, on this on this meet he came five minutes before the call so i'm going to introduce dave and then philip and then then diego uh, dave uh, dave is a founder of eco valley meets uh, he is uh, he's the guy who helps us with that, with the, with the, with the fancy and with the delicious meat that we all love, uh, he is he's in the third generation in the meat business. Um, he does a lot of retail as well as wholesale. He also own, owns a lot of farms. He does a lot of online as well as offline business. He likes to uh, specialize in the in the butcher shop, like old fashioned butcher shop, uh, maintaining good quality. Uh, Dave has. Uh, has a gourmet holiday gift catalog. Uh, he he has a, he has award-winning meat and delicious treats um, speciality. In 1998, uh, Dave started his own company, and he his aim was to make the best hams and the best sausages ever. Um, he went to Germany and Denmark to get trained by the best, so he could get into uh, the virtual gourmet shopping market. Uh, that's Dave for you. Uh, I'm going to come to Dave in a minute. I'm going to be asking a lot of questions to Dave. I'm, I'm also going to be asking you uh, a little more that you can tell about your business than what I've already covered. Thank you so much, Dave, for coming this morning. Philip, uh, Philip, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to request you uh, for, your, for your kidney and for your lungs. Uh, basically, I'm going to request you to uh, keep your phone down because people uh, would want your 100% attention. So, um, Philip, is the vice president uh, of uh, global sales and marketing uh, in the pickle juice company. Uh, the, the company was founded in 2001, is about two decades old, two decades young company. Uh, pickle juice port was designed to provide uh, a product targeting muscle cr uh, cramp relief. They are they have a specific uh, specific recipe of made up of pickle juice which helps you heal your muscle at least one point one fifty percent more effectively than any water or traditional sports drink. Uh, he's a direct, he has been a director of sales for 20th Fox Century, uh, Century Fox till March 2014. 
thank you so much, uh, Philip, for for coming uh, uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Diego, um, Diego is the head of product and strategy for Rice uh, Rice Gardens. Uh, he is a growth strategy expert uh, in the food and agri business and a food and agri business entrepreneur. Uh, before coming on board, he was um, he was leading strategy for a Peruvian company, and um, he loves to solve problems, uh, keeping keeping his customers at the center of attention of the business. So he loves his customers and he solves problems for his customers. That's the center of attention for his business, and. He was director of marketing and product in Harvest 2.0. Uh, that was what I prepared and now it's going to be all uh, fire chats, uh, no scripts, uh, all impromptu questions. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming over. Philip, let's start with, let's, let's start with you. Tell us something about whether your business is, is growing in the last five months. Did it grow in the last five months or did it not grow? Uh, what's happened with the business in the last five months? Yeah, uh, we're still up. Our, our, our gross and net uh, sales and revenue numbers are, are in the black. They're in the positive. However, uh, it required a, a shift in market strategy in order to achieve that. So uh, some of our traditional distribution channels are down. Other channels are up that are offsetting that. But our annual growth rate has decreased from about um, a 40% annual growth to about a 10% annual growth. But over the past five months, we are still uh, up year over year. Um, and fortunately, over overhead is lean enough that we haven't lost any profitability or any of that stuff. So we're, we're in better shape than than many and most people, so we're, we're really lucky for that. Excellent. So when you said you, your, your growth year on year was 40%, but now it is 10% and you had to do a marketing, uh, market strategy change uh, from traditional businesses which were going down. So you were thinking you change your marketing strategy to uh, achieve the growth that you currently have to move on to different channels. So can you, can you throw a little more light on this? What what did you change in the last five months, which helped you uh, keep the numbers uh, going? Sure. Historically, a lot of our uh, go-to-market strategy was based on something we, we call um, uh, it, it, product discovery, which puts the product in the hand of the, of the person when they need it most. So we were involved in about four to 500 different annual uh, participation-based sporting events, marathons, cycling races, things like that. Obviously, those things aren't happening right now. We don't have our high-profile partners like our international uh, cricket and rugby partners, our domestic NFL baseball partners. So we had to do a bit of a shift. We went to more of a grassroots um, brand ambassador-based uh, model, relying more heavily on, on social media interaction. Um, and then we also shifted some of our brick and mortar strategy into uh, we shifted some of our B2B strategy to a B2C model, uh, reallocating some of the budget and funds, um, looking at a, a closer at mining some of that dot com business rather than just harvesting. Uh, what platform do you use, Philip? To sell online? Uh, we have a Shopify platform, but it's a, it's a it's a fraction of our business. Most of our business is done through third-party retailers um, like Amazon and specialty retailers in, in the sporting goods space. So you are in marketplaces? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for the initial uh, introduction, Philip. Uh, Dave, tell us something about your business. How is the business in the last five months? Um, been interesting. Uh, being in the food business has definitely had its challenges with uh, shortages of production, prices doubling over the course of the weekend a few months back. Um, definitely has challenges. Um, we have retail, mail order, and catering. And um, what we've seen is we do a lot of corporate gifts, incentives, points, and reward programs. So when casinos are shut down and you're used to getting 2,000 orders a month and there is none, 
um, that's a big difference. And so, but the retail side of that picked up. And so you lost, we lost one, but we gained the other side on the, you know, on some of the dot com and some of the retail store for sure. So um, prices have changed drastically in my world. Um, and they're starting to finally get back to normal somewhat, uh, but, but it's been a challenge for sure. Meat prices have doubled in the weekend. Why? Not the weekend, uh, the beginning, a couple months ago during when COVID started, when all the plants got shut down and production ran out. And there was a course of one weekend, ribeyes on a Friday wholesale, they cost me eight sixty five, And by Monday morning, my cost was $14 a pound. <laughs> so it had its, uh, had its ups and downs for sure. So did it impact the customers coming to you? Were they, were they reluctant buying? Well, we were fortunate because some of the big box stores that all have to rely on the big packers to cut their meat, grind their hamburger, and all they do is put it in their, their stores, um, the big chain stores, we're old school. We don't slaughter, but we cut everything ourselves. So we never ran out of anything. Our prices changed drastically. But as far as inventory, we were pretty safe because we were still cutting everything and processing everything ourselves. So that made a very big difference on our supply chain where we never ran out. And uh, you know, even being right down the street from me as a Kroger, that's like literally two or three blocks. And we just saw retail numbers that we've never seen. And you know, I've been here 30 years, so a long time. Yes, definitely. So uh, Dave, you were mentioning that you were Magento initially and now you moved on to Shopify. Why? You, our viewers want to understand why somebody should move from Magento to Shopify. Well, um, I, I can tell you that one of the biggest reasons is, uh, I, so I'm the only, one of the only people that's been on Shark Tank twice and Mark Cuban is my partner. And so the first time we aired, we were on a Magento platform. We actually had a software glitch and I shipped $165,000 twice. I got paid for once. So it was catastrophic. Um, so Shopify really streamlined the updates and the, the processes. And we use something called Shipworks that bridges between our shipping stations. And so it's all automated now. And it's just Shopify has been really good for us. Mm -hmm. So what business of, you, of, you, of yours is online and how much is offline? Um, it's changed. Obviously it's changed this year, uh, you know, drastically. So I'm going to say right now it's probably uh 50, 50 online versus retail, but we've lost a lot of our corporate stuff because corporate America hasn't been there. So, so we lost one sector, but gained another sector. So it's kind of balancing itself out, you know, so to say. Mm -hmm. So did you, were you planning for this moving business online or did it happen, uh, automatically? Well, let me tell you this. The first time we aired on Shark Tank in um, 2012, 2013, in 12 hours, I had 1.2 million hits. And so our website, you know, we re-air on the re-air 17, 18 times a year. So every time we re-air, we see a very big, significant spike in, in viewers. So we, uh, we're always monitoring that and, and checking that as we go. And so we're, we know we get a lot of extra traffic just because of the organicness of the show. Excellent. How do you plan to retain this growth on Shopify? You got a lot of bunch of new customers that are coming to you on Shopify. How do you plan to retain them? Um, well, I can tell you this, uh, over 72% of our customers have ordered a minimum of three times. So I think once people get our Echo Valley meats in their mouth, we, they come back. My goal is not to chase the money. My goal is to give them the best product and the best service in the country and feed them well. And, you know, people, when it becomes, uh, I like to say our products become an experience around the table. And, uh, and whether it's the Cuban family or my own family or whatever, when so the kids are all saying, oh my goodness, this prime rib or this ham is the best I've ever had, it becomes a topic for five or 10 minutes and they figure out where it came from. And, oh, it's Echo Valley Meats. Oh, is that guy on Shark Tank, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it's, I like to say our food is, is that qual the high quality there is. Everything we do is my own recipes from scratch. Like you were saying, I went to Germany and Denmark back in 2000 and got trained overseas. And so um, it's a lot of proprietary stuff. It's old fashioned stuff. Excellent. Excellent, Dave. Good story. Thank you so much for coming over this morning. Thanks uh, for having me. Thank you. Uh, Diago, tell something about your business and uh, your journey and your story. Yes. So um, we, we sell these things on the back. You see, they look um, awesome. they're in, they're indoor gardens. Um, okay. Basically, over the last five months in the pandemic, everyone's staying home. Um, everyone is investing in their home. So that's made our business grow dramatically, um, which has been great and has been super lucky. Um, 
our issues have come on the other side where we were not ready to grow that fast. And the supply chain was more broken than expected because of COVID. So it's been an interesting journey, right? We were, before the pandemic, we were trying to find out what's the right messaging with the customer, how to communicate. It's a very new product. Um, it's basically a vertical farm for your living room. So go explain that to the customer in an easy, simple way to grab their attention in seven seconds in social media and yada, yada. Uh, and it changed, right? People started looking for products like ours uh, more proactively, which made that side much simpler. But then on the other side, we need to manufacture. And even though we're not a gigantic company, we do have a, a global supply chain which meant getting stuff from all over the world. Um, you know, Dave probably knows the Netherlands are the, the mecca of hydroponics. So we get some stuff from them and from other places and we make them in Mexico and make them cross the border. Um, so that, that became the challenge. And then um, a lot of the efforts that we are dedicating to be customer centric, as you mentioned in, in the intro, towards the customer in terms of, let me tell you what this is and tell you how it's gonna change your life, shifted to managing expectations and managing the weight that we were all in and, and trying to deliver on a higher than expected customer service, especially in such a stressful time. So it's been a journey, 100%. Excellent. So. Can I, can I, so when you, when we say managing somebody's expectation, uh, does it, does it mean fulfilling somebody's expectation or, or manipulating and managing? What do you mean by that? So it's mixed, right? Yes. You want to deliver on everyone's expectations, but sometimes you just can't. Mm. And it's more of being transparent and be having open communication and making it so that you can give a swift, fast, transparent answer to every customer. And so, you can try to do it at 100% of the cases. You don't necessarily always succeed. Uh, trying to minimize returns or trying to minimize uh, cancellations while people are waiting for the product. What uh, platform do you use, Diego? Shopify, too. So all of you are Shopify, Shopify partners and Shopify fans, huh? So, um, so, what, so you said in the building, you said you were not ready for this surge in business, this increase in business and Shopify, you, you're on Shopify. So what's your customer base at the moment online? Uh, so it's people that have a physical product around the 600. Okay. Uh, so those are people who shop, so, so somebody who's shopping from you once, for example, some, let's say I have a vertic, I have this garden in my living room. Uh, will I come to you again? If yes, why will I come to you, come to you again? And uh, if no, uh, what are you doing to bring them back? Because I'm asking this question is because a lot of people, for example, meat business or whether it's a, a, a pickle juice business, people want to come back again because they don't keep eating. But uh, a lot of business like a mattress, mattresses business or a business like a furniture business, people don't come to you very often. So mm -hmm. e-commerce folks, folks who are selling stuff like yours, uh, what strategies do you use to bring your customer back on your store, online store and make them buy something else? What, what, do, you, what do you do about that? So the, the product inherently is two products. You have the physical device, which is what you're seeing, and then the plants inside it and you need to buy seeds and pots, which are growth mediums, and you need to buy nutrients. Uh, those things are recurring revenue and recurring purchases that, that every customer needs to do because you'll grow a lettuce it's and like, then you'll cut that. It's like a coffee, hmm? machine. It's like a coffee machine where you give exactly. them a coffee machine and keep getting refilling from you. <laughs> yes, and on top of that, we have they have something in between, which we call add-ons, which are um, add-ons that go into the system that, let's say you want to grow a vining tomato. 
right? That needs a different structural support. So we sell this structural support that you can latch onto it and do X. Or we're gonna launch microgreens and you wanna grow microgreens. So it's a different module because microgreens need a different setup than the lettuce. Sure. Uh, and those are kind of like midpoint, uh, it's, they're on the midpoint between consumables and physical devices. Are you, are you funded, Diego? Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. I will come to you on that then. Uh, Philip, mm -hmm. are, you, are you guys funded? Are you guys uh, bootstrapping? No, I like, I, I like I mentioned during the introduction, we've been um, uh, named one of the top 10 fastest growing food and beverage companies in North America the last three years in a row. So we're really, really lucky there. We're entirely self-funded, um, profitable. We have zero, we care zero debt. So we're in pretty good shape. Just paid cash for a new 100,000 square foot manufacturing facility domestically and opened a couple offices overseas. So I think we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty lucky. We're pretty fortunate that um, things are going pretty well for us. Excellent. Uh, Philip, uh, so uh, you did not ever, so you guys are growing, you guys are among top 10 companies which are growing in this industry. Now, uh, how many SKUs do you carry on your website? Um, again, our, our, our website is only a fraction of our sales. We, we, offer sales on the site for, frankly, it's, it's specific to mom and pop B2C, uh, B2B on our website. Most, most of our uh, dot com sales occur on Marketplace uh, because we have a lower average transactional value than Diego and Dave probably do. Um, so we, you know, our philosophy around here is don't make it hard for the customer to give you their money. So we um, we find that the marketplace is um, more efficient because of the volume that we're doing. Um, as a matter of fact, we had a shift from a seller central to a vendor central platform on Amazon just because we were we were shipping truckloads at a time. Um, so it became a logistical feat rather than sort of a um, you know, control thing. Uh, so to answer your question, I think on our website, I'm going to guess eight SKUs, maybe that's kind of a guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Dave, uh, you are third generation in the business. Uh, how are you doing things differently than your uh, predecessors? Um, you know, we do a lot of, uh, stuff like customization. You can get a cutting board from us with your name on it one at a time. There's no setup charges. There's no plate charges. There's no, we do a lot of stuff in house. So we offer, um, customization. We are a, a Yeti authorized dealer. Also, there's only two of us in the country that are authorized to sell Yeti blank products in a wholesale market. So we've came up with some cool ideas of putting meat inside of Yeti coolers as a wow gift. And so we have a lot of corporate people that will spend, you know, $500, 300 bucks on a cooler and $200 on the meat. And all of a sudden a cooler of Yeti meat shows up at your house. So, so we've kind of, it's not recreating the wheel, but just doing things differently and a little, I, I'd say more unique um, than some of our competitors doing everything that they don't want to do. I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Uh, let me, let me pull up a first poll question. All right. Uh, I'll allow you to participate. I'm launching a poll now. Hopefully you are able to see your screen and this question. So guys, uh, this question is, do you know which customers you're losing? People, people are coming online and shopping from you. Do you know which ones you're losing? Uh, which ones will never come back and shop from, shop, shop from you again? I'm ending the poll in one, two, three, four, five. All right. Philip, do you know which customers you, you lose on the store? They might not ever come back to you. Do you know them? Yeah, we do. We look at abandoned cart um, data because what we're really looking to do is determine if we're losing that customer from our system as a whole or if we're just share shifting to another platform. We found that while our total abandoned cart rate on our own website was relatively high, we found that on the 
the B2B retention is hot, is good, and we're losing B2C, what we're finding is that that's probably 85 to 90% of share shift where um, people are coming to our, our website more for informational purposes and then transacting either at brick and mortar or Amazon or somewhere else. So we, um, we look at a banner cart probably once every two weeks to see who's leaving and why. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Dave, do you know which customers uh, you lose or you're losing online? Um, yes and no. There are certain times of the year, like the last four or five months, we really haven't had time to study that data. Um, but like, but like uh, uh, Philip said, we do look at our abandoned cart and stuff like that. But we, you know, like I said earlier, we have a 72 plus percent retention rate of customers coming back multiple times. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, be honest with you, whether it's FedEx, UPS, U.S. Postal, sometimes it might take eight or nine days for no inherent reason, and you get a really upset customer, and so they're mad at us, and so we lose a customer over a situation like that that we had no control over. Um, we always try to make it right. We stand behind it, even sometimes where it's not our fault or we have zero control over. Um, but, you know, sometimes you get people that just uh, are upset with situations like that, too. So, so we've seen it all. So, Philip and Dave, both of you said that you know which customers you're losing, yes and no, because you are checking your abandoned cart. Do you think just because somebody abandoned their cart, they are never going to come back to you? Is that the right parameter to measure? Oh, no. like, I, like, like I said, that we, we identified that they, we aren't losing them. It's just a share shift to a different platform. And, and frankly, we're okay with that. We don't mind a share shift. Um, we find that where a lot of times when the, when the cart's abandoned, they're, they're not leaving our site. They're going to another place with, within our platform. So I think there's just exploring. And I think a lot of the cart, abandoned cart activity is uh, informational rather than transactional. And we, we do peer review. We do, uh, sorry, we, we do studies and analysis. We did a broadline sampling um, program um, a couple of months ago to kind of determine the consumer behavior and interaction with our, with our products. And we don't think we're losing them. We just think they're going somewhere else to buy it. I mean, obviously some people are going to look at it and kick the tires and not buy. Um, but, but I think our retention is, is frankly pretty decent. And then once they do transact, we, we, we low pressure re-promote to them as well. And we get very few opt-outs and, and pretty decent uh, open and click rates. Mm -hmm. Dave, what's your answer to that? Do you think abandoned, measuring, measuring abandoned card is the right way to measure whether you're losing a customer or not? No, because what I see, especially around the fourth quarter in my world, we will see somebody go online and uh, it might be an abandoned card on a Monday, but all of a sudden Thursday, that customer came back and spent several hundred dollars. So it's like they're shopping along the way or they're, they fell asleep at night while they're shopping or they're trying to figure out gifts for their family members or whatever the case might be. And, and like Philip said, we, we're very happy with a 72 plus percent retention rate. And we know we're never going to, you know, keep the whole world happy in the hundred, we're going to get hundred percent. That's just not reality. So we do the best we can, uh, we, you know, and just try to take care of everybody. Excellent. That's the right. That's, that's absolutely correct. So uh, Diego, are you losing customers online? What's your take on that? Do you know which customers you're losing? I do. Now there's different, there's different levels of losing, I would say in our business, there's people that were considering buying the device and didn't buy it. And there's people that after they purchase the device are buying consumables like the seats and the nutrients and they stop buying that. And I think those are two very different things to manage. We know the ones that are on the consumables since we have an app, we know who's planting and not buying from us. And out of that, we can assume that they're buying from someone else. Um, and then since they're using our platform and they're using our app, it's relatively easy to communicate with them and try to re-engage them. So finding a, a variety that they want or finding the right uh, bulk pricing or finding the right package and presentation uh, 
is some of the things that we're working on that side. On the side of if you're ready or not to buy a device of this level of sophistication, I'd say there's two groups. One is at the very beginning of the year, we were ramping, very, ramping up very quickly with schools. Now, and this is something that schools were dying over. Uh, this, is, this, this is a great device to teach kids about the life cycle. Uh, kindergarten teach about the life cycle and high school kids about chemistry and, and plant sciences. And with COVID, schools shut down. They're not doing any capital investment in equipment for the classroom because there might not be a classroom for another number of months. Um, so we lost them in terms of customer customers that we were acquiring. Uh, it's starting to ramp up again, but I don't think it's going to be nearly as fast as it was at the beginning of the year. And part of what we're doing is we're working on what other versions of this or what, what add-ons could we build around it uh, to enable teachers to do remote while also using a device like this or while also using our device to increase the quality of teaching. Mm -hmm. I think the other segment of customers are people that are trying to start to garden and they want to learn about gardening and they want to take their first step at it. Uh, I honestly do believe that we're a great product for that. But some people don't feel comfortable with making a, our cheapest product is $550. And that might be okay to start a hobby for some people that might not be okay for some other people. And if you're not there, you're not there. We don't want you to feel that you're spending this crazy high amount of money, which again, for some people it is, for some people it isn't. Uh, and set your expectations in a place where we're not, we're not gonna be that company, right? Cool. We're, our product is gonna make it super easy for you, but it's not zero work. Because gardening is work. And everyone that has ever gardened knows that it's work and you need to enjoy doing the work. Right. Um, and going back to what you said in the beginning about customer centricity, we're learning what each of these other customers that we're not acquiring proficiently, uh, or that we're not great at acquiring really need, and then designing something for them and creating something for them. We're gonna launch, uh, we're calling it the personal garden, which is a way smaller version of this garden. Um, it's a ninth of the size of what you're seeing right here. And it takes 20 seconds to assemble. It has the same level of growth. It, the ticket is half or less than the cheapest version of this bigger size garden. And we hope that with that one, we can attract um, the not so proficient gardeners and the people that are more interested in exploring gardening as an opportunity and want a low ticket item to do that or have a constrained space. Sure. Um, for the teachers, we're creating this site product that, that we will sell in a bundle with a garden, which is, we're calling it a planter jar, but it's basically a mason jar sure. with an adaptation, a 3D printed adaptation so that the teachers can start the plants in the classroom. And then the, when the kids come to pick up stuff from school, as they're doing right now, uh, they take their plant home with them. Okay. And, and then you can do online classes, each one with their plants. Very nice, very nice. Interesting, interesting. Uh, we, we have a bunch of customers in the US. Uh, somehow somebody is selling wine, somebody is selling toys. Um, most of them are on Shopify and we have so our Inalto app for Shopify is able to tell them which customers will never come back. So these are the sort of customers who never come back. Specifically pinpointing why they will not come back. Specifically pinpointing how you can make them come back. So that's one of the features of our product, which I would like to run through you guys maybe next week sometimes. Uh, anyways, I will move on to a discussion to D Dave. You are third generation in the business. Why did you go to Shark Tank and struck a deal with the uh, Mark Cuban? 
Well, I am third generation in the meat business. However, I left my family business in 1998 because in 1996, I said I wanted to get in the internet business. And my father and my uncle, who were born in Lebanon and came here in 1942, thought I was crazy and laughed me out of the house. And uh, they wanted to know who would ever order meat through the internet. And so uh, I believed in myself, started Echo Valley Meats from scratch, literally November 1st of 1998. And so... Uh, you know, I always say this, if your dreams are not bigger than reality, you have a problem with your dreams. Because if you cannot think big, you sure as hell are never going to get big. And uh, I'm not afraid to fail. And I failed a lot more times than I've succeeded in the last 20 some years, I can tell you that. But, uh, but you know what, we just keep plugging away. Excellent, excellent. So how was the experience in Shark Tank? What will you, what will you advise people who are going to Shark Tank, who are preparing for Shark Tank and are failing? What would you advise them? Um, well, I was very fortunate because I had been in business, uh, you know, 15 years before I ever went on Shark Tank, 20 years before I went on Shark Tank. And so um, I had, you know, my accounting, I was a profitable company. What Shark Tank really did for me was just help catapult me in front of millions of viewers when the sharks were all saying it's great product, it's great this. Um, you know, it opened up our doors the next day. I mean, uh, I, I had 4,200 emails, I think, the first night and opportunities from every buyer in the country wanting to sell our products. But, uh, but I actually chose not to. I actually chose to control my brand and not put it in any box stores ever. Um, I, I say if I put a summer sausage in a store in California and that product goes out of date or it gets moldy or something, they don't look at it as, oh, the store forgot to rotate it or the store pulled, didn't pull it out of date. They look at it as, what's so special about Echo Valley? I'm picking up outdated or moldy products. So we've chosen a, a different growth strategy, which is much slower and much more contained, but it's to the end user. So the profit margins are higher and we control it instead of having to you know, sell for pennies to all the wholesalers and let them beat you up. I've been down that road before. <laughs> so, um, how is it working with, working with Mark? How, how is Mark? Uh, he looks like a tough guy from outside. He's, he's like very, very choosy when it comes to picking up and investing his money. He doesn't invest in a lot of businesses. So, why did he choose you? Um, well, Mark and his family actually became a customer after the first show when we didn't get a deal. And so uh, several of them had. And so uh, I think he really understood and believed that we had great product and we took care of business. And so um, to be honest with you, when I went back the second time, I, I tell people in life, if you get any second chance, no matter what it is, you better make it count. And I knew if I had a second chance and I got an opportunity with Mark, I didn't care what the other offers were. I wanted to go with Mark. And so he's just a normal guy. I mean, you can email him. You can get in touch with him if you need. He's always responding back. His family orders all the time. Uh, we ship him stuff sometimes, you know, all over. So, so it's, it's been really, really good for us. Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Wonderful. One of the guys I was interviewing uh, two days back, his name is Tony Lamb. Tony was selling brew coffee and he also he struck a deal with Barbara and um, uh, very nice guy. And um, he said, Amit, before I went to this shock tank, I watched every episode three times. I noted all the questions they were asking. I had answers to everything that they were asking. I, they were, you must know your number. So this guy was that detailed. Uh, before he went into Shark Tank and got stuck a deal with Barbara. Uh, excellent, excellent advice. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm sure Mark's uh, network and Mark's guidance is helping you grow, uh, but you chose to limit yourself to, to, to a select few so that you can maintain your quality and maintain your, maintain your premiumness and maintain your uh, uh, high margins. Uh, that versus uh, uh, Diago, you... Uh, you have uh, investors on board. What's your strategy? Are they saying burn more cash, get more customers? Burn more cash, get more customers. Are you also looking at profitability? We are looking at profitability. Um, we uh, we got funded, um, which has been great. But since the very beginning, we never wanted to be a business only focused on growth. Um, we believe in, in responsible growth um, and doing it the right way and growing with our customers and, and leveraging our own customer base into referrals and building a brand. So we're doing, we're taking that route. So responsible growth is a very good term. I just learned it from you. I'm going to use it in my next webinar. Uh, <laughs> you know what? A lot of companies uh, who don't believe in responsible growth, uh, for example, Amazon took 10 years to become profitable. A lot of other companies, Ubers or a lot of other companies in the world are now just striving to get more customers, uh, burn more cash uh, because investors cash is not their cash. 
Philip, what could you say about that? That strategy. A uh, uh, lot of businesses are just burning more cash and getting more customers. What would you advise them? It's not sustainable. Don't do it. I, I tell people all the time: if you're not making, if you're not making profit on case one, you're not going to make a profit on case a thousand and one. Um, I think. Uh, a sustainable growth strategy and a sustainable transactional strategy is critical for long-term success. Uh, people are starting to see through the hyperinflated valuations of the like internet boom times. I think people are, are now looking for. Um, I mean, if if you need if you need financing, they're not going to give it to you just based on growth anymore. They're, they want to see. Uh, they want to see a profitability model. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We look at, at prof profitability. We don't deficit spend. Um, and, and to Dave and Diego's points, we would much rather grow slow and strategic than really, really fast. Sure. So, but there are a lot of businesses which are still uh, not, as per you, are doing a responsible growth and people are there like they have crazy valuation of a billion, two billion, five billion, ten billions. Uh, what was going on there? What, what do you say about that? Again, I think a lot of it's it's over valuations. I think a lot of those companies are valuation based on uh, potential. I, I really don't believe in. I, I'm more of a burn in the hand type of person. Um, and again, I, I work in the CPG space. In technology, it's a bit different, right? A lot of people look at uh, potential revenue and, and probable revenue infrastructure uh, infrastructure valuations. But I mean, everyone on this panel is, at the end of the day, selling a good or an item. Um, we it, it, we're not selling a concept. We're we're selling a, a, an actual thing. So. I think our valuation strategies are a lot more predictable and 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 easier to determine and less likely to be artificially inflated for acquisition or financing for funding purposes. And I don't know if Dave and Diego, if you disagree with that, but no, Dave, I agree with you. He agrees with you. Dave agrees with you. Dave, Dave, a lot of people who who want to come in the e-commerce business as of yesterday. Uh, but something is stopping them. Uh, either the idea they believe they don't believe in the idea or they don't have money. Uh, what would you advise people who want to jump into e-commerce yesterday? Um, well, it's it's really easy to sell somebody anything once. It's how do you fulfill it? How do you take care of it? And in my world, being in a perishable world is ninety nine percent trickier and tougher than anything else you ship because we're selling fresh fresh frozen meat. And dry ice, you can only put 5.5 pounds in the air or you have to send it ground. So you have either two choices overnight or, you know, three or four day and you have to put enough dry ice in there to get it three or four day. So, um, so you better really understand the logistics part of it and how you're going to get it from point A to point B successfully and on time to keep that customer happy. Just making the sale is the easy part. It's, this, it's after the sale. Is it manual entry? Is it a bridge that's doing the automation for you? So if you ship it to the wrong address, the consumer entered the wrong address or we entered the wrong address. There's all kinds of little things like that that, uh, that obviously I've learned over the years. So execution is the key. Education is the key, absolutely. And, and be smart enough to admit what you don't know and to wanna learn. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Education, execution, both. You executed perfectly. Well, I don't know if there's any such thing as perfectly, but we still are learning. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Let me let me launch my second poll question. Uh, all right. All right. This is one of my favorite questions. Let me just launch it now. Are you getting enough ROI from your digital marketing and ad spend? So I know there's the the word enough is perhaps not the right words. We think that enough is never enough. But um, are you happy with your ad spend on Google, Facebook, other other marketing channels? I'm gonna end the poll in one, two, three, four, five. All right. So 71 percent people say that we are not happy with the the ad spend. Uh, let me ask uh, Dave. Dave, uh, where do you buy your customers from? 
Okay, in other words, in simpler, in more uh, sophisticated terms, uh, where do you put your ads if you do? Well, this might this might shock everybody here on the panel and everybody watching, but I have not spent one nickel on advertising in five years. Wow, wow. not one. I, I I would rather I I do things of sending samples out. Um, we will send hundreds and hundreds of samples out. And I look at it this way. If 72% of the people that I send a sample out become a customer, my return on investment pays for itself with usually within the second order. So, so that's what we've chosen to do is, especially in the corporate world, because we go after more of companies with incentive programs and points and stuff like that, rather than a lot of the onesie twosie. So I, I send out thousands and tens of thousands of dollars a year in sample samples and end up acquiring customers that way. So I'm not spending a digital print, a Google print, a Facebook, none of that stuff. So what's your customer acquisition cost? Uh, well, mine is much lower because we re-air 17 to 19 times a year on Shark Tank. And so mine is about 18 bucks right now. <laughs> mine is much lower for somebody being in the meat business because just your shipping cooler, dry ice and gift box is that in itself. So. Sure. So what do you say about that, Diego? Ads versus no ads versus SEO versus content. What do you do? Uh, we're trying to do everything mm -hmm. and learn what's the right mix. And okay. I, I, I honestly think that's part of that's part of that idea of responsible growth. Okay. It's not about picking one channel and throwing all your money behind that. It's about finding what's the right mix that works for your customer base, that increases your growth. So we're working on everything. We're trying to do, do a lot of things, right? And, and try a lot of things and, and see what's working and what not, what's not working. Um, so I think we're happy with the results we're getting. Uh, we obviously want more and everyone wants more, but I think that, as I mentioned, just throwing all your money behind uh, digital and, and digital advertising will lead you to that spiral of, you need to spend more to get more and you need to spend more to get more. And, and if you leave behind the idea of, I need to build a brand, I need to become relevant to my customer beyond just the use of my product. I wanna become part of their life and I'm already part of their house. So it, should, it shouldn't be a hard path for me to become an, an engaged part of their life. Uh, so, and even the app for us is key, like as a selling mechanism, because it increases your, it improves your experience. And then from there, we're working on enabling you to post directly in social media and, and generate your own awareness, your own personal awareness with our brand tagging along for the ride. Um, so we're very multi-channel in every possible way and we're trying different things and we're trying to see what works. So well, what's your take on this, Philip? Uh, our, our strategy is very similar to Dave's where uh, we don't buy customers necessarily. We rely pretty heavily on, on sampling because our product is a functional product. So um, if we're able to prove the functionality of, of that product uh, at the point when you need it, you're hooked, right? If you either get muscle cramps or you don't, if we relieve those muscle cramps, that, that's, that's really all you need. And our product works so well that we believe in it, we stand behind it. And that's not intended to be arrogant, that's, that's, that's just reality. Uh, we don't do any broadline advertising. Um, the, the little paid media we do do is generally tied directly to an ROI on a transactional platform. Um, so we do a lot on Amazon. We benchmark a lot there, um, but our um, average cost of sales, our ACOS, and our um, our ROAS, which are the two key metrics that they use, um, is outperforms their industry benchmarks by about three threefold. So um, our ACOS is uh, in the single digits. Our ROAS is in the double digits. So, and we really don't spend much, much at all there at all. Um, it's, it's really only counter pro programming some copycat products. Um, but as far as broadline media, we, we, we'd much rather let the product speak for itself and work on um, like my counterparts 
uh, on this uh, forum seem to agree with it and work on organic, real, and passionate consumer acquisition. Uh, that way you get them once and you keep them rather than having to kind of hunt for all, all these maybe customers that don't become repeat business. I think all three of us agree we'd rather have 72% recurring transactions than uh, 72 single transactions. Excellent. So you, you so clearly Dave and Flip are on the same side. Uh, that that clearly assures that the sampling is a good way. I haven't heard of this before, but uh, in the food and beverage industry, definitely, if you are very confident about your product, you must try sampling. That's one learning that we got from Dave and Philip. I will launch my last poll question immediately. Um, all right, launching it now. Do you know the do you know your customer's lifetime value? In other words, do you know which customer will pay you how much in next one year? Which customer will pay you how much in next one year? Are you able to predict your customer's revenue, every customer's revenue? Okay, I'm gonna end up end it now in five counts. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so 75 people, 75 percent people do not know uh, the customer's lifetime value. They don't know how much a customer wanna pay, uh, pay them. All right. Uh, Dave, what's, what was your answer? My answer was no. Um, we, we don't, I can tell you what the average spend is, but it's, it's hard to predict because what we see is a lot of times is once we get a customer in once, all of a sudden um, they're sending out multiple gifts. And so it changes for us year after year. And so uh, it, typically it goes up in my world, it doesn't go down, which is good. I mean, that is one of the uh, factors that we do look at. Are they spending more, are they spending less? And typically most of our customers end up spending more over a period of time. But how much more, what's the value? We don't know that. That I don't know. Yeah, I would not. Have that Philip, what's your, what was your answer? Uh, we do. We're pretty lucky because we have a lot of class or trade benchmarking, um, and it, it's 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 weird, but it's relatively predictable. Um, again, about seventy-five to eighty percent of our our businesses uh, recurring recurring B two B, and we find that uh, class of trade behavior is is relatively consistent. We find that our average weekly transactional rate at mass is is very similar whether it's uh regardless of the retailer uh flag uh same thing with grocery same thing with professional sports teams uh, if you eliminate um hyper or slow um uh hyper or, or, or slow transactional outliers we find that um as long as that person's a customer, it's a pretty predictable transaction rate. As a matter of fact, that's how we go to market. We, we look at when we acquire a new uh, grocery retailer, for instance, we know they're gonna do on average X amount of dollars in sales per week, uh, multiplied out by the amount of doors. And we take some demographic information into it. So it allows us to forecast within about a 5% margin of error. So we're, we're, we're fairly, happy with that cool that's nice that's great in the last round i will maybe ask you guys if you want to ask a question to a fellow panelist if let's say they want to ask the question to diago or philip or, or vice versa uh, shoot your questions if you have some we good okay. excellent uh cool I would like to thank you all uh, for the fabulous discussion that we have. This, this discussion is being recorded and we're going to be disseminating it into on different channels. Uh, you guys uh, were very, very uh, nice and honest in your answers and uh, we learned a lot. I'm sure a lot of people who are in the in these businesses or people who are learning in the, in the FNB businesses have learned a lot from this session. They can they could use some of your some of your uh, mistakes, some of your uh, ideas. Some of your suggestions could easily be used and thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming up this morning and sharing your views and thoughts on this fabulous topic. Thank you so much, guys. What, what is Excellent. your viewer audience? How many people typically watch your shows here? So we, we, we're going to be sending it out on, on 
several channels on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. I mean, there are about thousands of people who will watch this once we disseminate into smaller portions. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be cutting this one hour video into five, five minute videos, uh, 20 such videos, and we're going to, because people have a short attention span. So I'll be asking a question and let's say you answer the question. So it'll be a five minute video. You can send that out. I'm going to send, we're going to be sending these videos to you as well. So all of you will get this video snippets, so to say, and we will be sending the video snippets to you. They'll be hosted on YouTube. And then we'll request you to send these and share these uh, small, small snippets, five minutes, three minutes video snippets on your platform so that people can consume it easily because we can't really get them big chunk to consume. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Have a fantastic day ahead. You too. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, guys. Good luck to everybody. Likewise. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.